you take my brokenness What I would call distress All you ask of me is lay it at your feet You take those days and nights Where I would rather hide And you call me out Beyond the clouds ooh, 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 mm -hmm. You make me new You make me more like you You And you make me new You make me more Take the hurt and pain Which weigh me down like chains And you break me free Now it's you I see You take my fears and shame I'll never be the same Because you're greater than your grace
more than blood, the kind of blood that washes it away. Now the door is open wide, and the stone's been rolled aside. The old is gone, the light has come. So come on and rise up. Take a breath, you're alive now. Can't you hear the voice of Jesus calling us out from the grave like Lazarus? Church, welcome to IPC. We hope that this hour will be an amazing hour of your week. It's Communion Sunday, so make sure to grab your elements for the necessary time during this service. If you're a youth, 
or if you have children at your home, we have programs for you. Follow our YouTube page and our Facebook link for the programs there. This Sunday will be our last Sunday of virtual coffee. So make sure you join us at 1110. Grab your coffee, your treats, and be prepared for a good conversation. On June 20th, we'll be opening our doors at Intricate Presbyterian Church. We'll be having two services, one at 9 a.m. and one at 11 a.m. They'll both have very limited seating, so make sure that you pre-register early. We'll have the necessary links for you to register on our emails, so make sure that you um, check those for the latest and the greatest updates. We'll be also hoping to live stream the service starting at 9 a.m. on our Facebook page. So join us there if you're joining us from your home. Also, finally, we'll be hiring a new site manager for the Raw Carrot. So if you're interested in finding out more details about this position, please contact the office and we'll get you all that information. So let's gather together and worship. Come on, church. Let us be the house of prayer you made us to be. Let us see the spirit in surrender on our knees. Let us be the house of praise you created us to be. Let us see the kingdom of a God who set us free.
I can feel redemption on the wind. Forgiveness like the tide rolling in. Taking up the space where shame is laid. Receiving all that you die to give. Let the wind blow. Let the tide roll. To the earth knows. You're God of love. Let me dry bones. Sing a new song. All the glory to the God of love. Stand a chance when I stand in your love. My fear doesn't 
nothing stand a chance when I stand in your love. Shame no longer has a place to hide. And I am not a captive to the lies. I'm not afraid to leave my past behind. Why won't be shaking? Why won't be shaking? Cause my fear doesn't stand a chance when I stand in your love. My fear doesn't stand a chance when I stand in your love. My fear doesn't stand a chance when I stand in your love. There's power that can break off every chain There's power that can empty out a grave There's resurrection power that can save There's power in your name Power in your name Oh, my fear doesn't stand a chance When I stand in your love, my fear doesn't stand a chance when I stand in your love. My fear doesn't stand a chance when I stand in your love. When I'm standing in your love, oh my fear doesn't stand a chance when I stand in your love. My fear doesn't stand a chance when I stand in your love. My fear. Doesn't stand a chance when I stand in your love. Well, I do want to remind everyone uh, that we are having communion at the uh, the conclusion of our service today after I speak. So if you haven't heard or if you haven't gotten those elements, just uh, get some bread and some juice and be prepared to receive uh, communion at that time. Let's pray. Lord, it's an amazing thing to be yours, to live this life in relationship with God, to know your blessing, uh, your, your strength, your comfort, your, your hope, your joy. And Lord, we come before you Sunday by Sunday to hear your word that we might enter more fully into what it means to follow Jesus. So, Lord, speak to us today. Open our minds, open our hearts uh, to this word, and let it be a living word to all who listen. As we pray in Christ's name, amen. Well, in 2018, a young missionary named John Chow landed on North Sentinel Island. Uh, it's It's an island that is governed by India. It is well to the east of India, the continent itself, closer to Indonesia, if you would. Um, he was determined to share Christ with the unreached people group who lived on that small island. He knew it was dangerous. Uh, others had landed, I think, uh, prior to this in 2006, a couple of men, and they had been instantly killed. And he knew he was taking his life in his hands by going. Um, this group of people uh, had, uh, was protected. The Indian government said, don't go. It's not allowed. They didn't want this, these people, this tribe of people, touched by civilization as we would define it because they had never been uh, contacted before. But John Chow felt called by God to go, and he paid 300 and so many dollars to have a fishing vessel drop him off nearby. He kayaked into the shore. When he landed on the beach, uh, he was immediately killed, shot with bow and arrow. His body was buried in a shallow grave on the beach, and it was never recovered. Question for you. What do you think of John Chow? Uh, The leader of his mission organization called him a martyr. Others called him a fool. I want to read you this quote from somebody who thought that. It says this, John Chow is no martyr. He's just a dumb American who thought the tribals needed Jesus. What do you think? What do you think? There were just a few dozen people on that island. Was it worth his life? Um, He knew that he would likely die if he tried to communicate with these people. 
Is he to be honored for his conviction and courage? Or is he to be thought of as a misguided fool? Well, the reason I ask you this question is that we're going to study a passage today from Scripture uh, in which someone does something and these two perspectives are given about this individual and what has happened. It follows after the raising of Lazarus in John 11. We've spent some Sundays thinking about that. This is the beginning of John chapter 12. I'm going to read the text to you, but I want you to remember this. This is just days prior to the, to the death of Christ, his crucifixion. Uh, he's about to be arrested, beaten, crucified, and buried. It's an amazing thing that the, he is with, with Lazarus in this instance, the one who was dead and has come back to life. Now here, the one who is alive is about to die before he too comes back to life. Anyway, let me read John chapter 12 to you. We'll look at it in three sections. Let me read... John 12, 1 to 3, first of all. Six days before the Passover, Jesus came to Bethany where Lazarus lived, whom Jesus had raised from the dead. Here a dinner was given in Jesus' honor. Martha served while Lazarus was among those reclining at the table with him. Then Mary took about a pint of pure nard, an expensive perfume. She poured it on Jesus' feet and wiped his feet with her hair. And the house was filled with the fragrance of the perfume. And it's obviously the, that the people at this uh, meal were just thrilled with what Jesus had done. Um, he has just, in, in some past time, raised Lazarus to life. Martha is there, the sister of Lazarus. She's doing what she does. She serves the meal as the active, engaged person. Lazarus is at the table, um, likely with other men, but not much is said about him. We don't know much about Lazarus beyond this. But Mary, Mary does something that would have absolutely shocked people. It was stunning. As she anoints Jesus' feet with an incredibly expensive perfume and oil. Now, I want us to re- think about where, where Ma- Martha, uh, Mary is again. Three times we see her in the gospel at the f- Gospels at the feet of Jesus. The first time in Luke, she is a disciple, a learner, sitting at Jesus' feet as he teaches. She's just soaking in this knowledge from the Son of God, learning what it means to follow him, learning what it means to be part of the kingdom of God. Then in chapter 11, we see her coming and falling at the feet of Jesus after her brother has died. Lord, if you had been here, my brother would not have died, she says. Lord, why? Help me understand. Why didn't you come? And then here, chapter 12, She takes this perfume and she pours it out on Jesus' feet. She's at his feet again. Now listen, in this day, servants would have washed an honored guest's feet with water. Um, Often also guests would have just a, a drop of this ointment placed in their forehead and allowed that perfume to scent them. But, but, but what Martha, Mary does here is a whole lot more than those things. She takes this bottle bottle of this perfume and she pours it out on his feet, all of it. What's she doing? Well, number one, she is acting as a servant. This is what servants do, but she's amplified the act. And secondly, and more importantly, let's think about the posture that she takes again, as we have previously. As she wipes Jesus' feet with her hair. I want you to take a minute and think about that. I think if we were together, what I would actually do is have someone come and stand beside me. I would get down on my hands and knees no more. I would lie flat on my face in front of this person in order to wipe. I'd have a wig on, I suppose. I'd have to. But to wipe that person's feet with my hair. She is prostrate before Christ. She is, she is on her face before the Lord. She is in this place of humble bowing before the Son of God. And she's using this perfume. Perfume that likely came from a flowering plant that grew in the Himalayas of Tibet, even in that day, northern India or or Nepal. This perfume, as it's later noted, is worth a year's wages for the normal working person. It's an incredibly expensive possession to have. It was often purchased as an investment. 
And here what she does with this precious treasure is outlandish. It's remarkable as she pours it on the feet of Jesus. And I want to tell you what is actually happening here is that she is engaged in an act of worship of the Lord Jesus himself. She's obviously incredibly thankful for what Jesus has done for her brother. She's communicating to him how incredibly valuable he is as a result to her. You know, he is worthy of this gift, Mary is saying in the act. Probably there is nothing more valuable that Mary owns than this perfume. And she's communicating to Jesus, you are more valuable than this treasure that I'm pouring on your feet today. You are of ultimate worth. You were of greatest value in my life. To, 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 to me, you, compared to this, 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 this perfume, it's nothing. You are of greatest value to me. No, this is an act of worship. Kneeling, bowing, humbling herself before Christ. Serving him. But more than this, she is sacrificially giving to him a gift of incredible value so that he knows her heart toward him. So that he knows that he is of greatest value and of greatest worth to Mary. Add to this, as the text says in verse 3, that this fragrance from the perfume filled the house. Can you imagine? And you can't read that and not think about the incense that was burned in the temple filling that place with a beautiful fragrance that would rise up to the God who was being worshipped. No, this, my friends, is Mary worshipping Christ. Then comes verse 4 to 6. Um, very different perspective. Listen to this. But one of his disciples, Judas Iscariot, who was later to betray him, objected why wasn't this perfume sold and the money given to the poor? It's, it was worth a year's wages. He did not say this because he cared about the poor, but because he was a thief. As keeper of the money bag, he used to help himself to what was put into it. See, this is, this is a very different heart that we're hearing from. This is, this is Judas looking at what Mary has done and thinking of her as a fool. Why would you do this, he asks. This is a waste of money, he says. This money could be given to the poor, but my friends, he wasn't concerned about the poor. He was concerned about himself and his own potential benefit. He, who was the keeper of the, the money bag, the, the kitty, if you would, of the disciples of Jesus, he who was a thief, he wanted that money for himself, not for anyone else. See, what we're seeing here is an incredibly different heart. I don't think Judas understood what Mary was doing. Again, this lack of understanding on the part of a disciple does not understanding, not getting it, not really coming to that place of, of enlightenment. You see, G he, he, Judas <laughs> thought Mary was a fool because the money was valuable. But he didn't recognize Christ as valuable in that moment in the way that Mary did. Well, after this opinion comes another. And it comes from the person of Jesus himself. Listen to verses 7 and 8. Ge Leave her alone, Jesus replied. It was intended that she should save this perfume for the day of my burial. You will always have the poor among you, but you will not always have me. I think it's absolutely beautiful that in this instance, when Mary is being attacked and criticized and condemned for what she has done, that Jesus stands up and he defends her. He comes and, and he affirms what she has done as she has used this perfume, not for his, his burial. Now note the word, as it was intended. That was the intention for the use of this oil, but to worship him while he was still alive seems that Mary understands that this death of Jesus is coming. It seems that she is this one of these few who grasps what's going on in the life of Christ and what God is doing. And she worships Christ, yes, for the raising of Lazarus, but also 
for what he is about to do for her and for the world. And what Jesus is saying is, don't condemn Mary. She is no fool. What she is doing is right. She's got it right. She understands. Not only in her heart, but she is right in, in her worshipful act. And I want to tell you, my friends, when we look at these two responses, it's Mary that we are to become like. It's Mary that we are to think like. It's Mary like we, that we are to act like. It is Mary that we are to live like. Certainly not Judas. Now, what does this mean for us? First of all, it starts with an understanding of who Jesus is and what he has done. It starts with Mary seeing his work in raising her brother to new life. And as we have talked about for several works from John chapter 11, her eyes have been opened to see the glory of God. She has seen the magnificence and the power and the beauty and the majesty and the wonder of God in Christ. And she is ready to worship this one named Jesus. But as I've said, he, she also sees his upcoming death on the cross, on her behalf. She sees what he, she, what he is about to do <laughs> to fulfill the Father's world, will to create salvation for us all, and she worships him. You see, she's communicating to Jesus how he is of greatest value and of greatest worth in her life. My friends, it is for us to come to that place also. We have got to come to that place where we see the glory of God because when we see the glory of God, whether it be through his action in our life or whether it be when we look to the cross of Jesus and understand what he did for us and from this world, that we will come to that place of recognizing that he is to be worshipped, that he is of greatest value, that he is of greatest worth in our lives too. Have you come to that place? I ask again, have you, have you seen the glory of God? Have you come to that place where your eyes have been opened, where you are left in awe at the majesty of Christ, having recognized what he has done for you? I want to tell you, my friends, if we come to that place, we humble ourselves before him. We bow in his presence, recognizing his greatness. We serve him with our lives. <laughs> and we learn to give to him in a significant way. So it starts with seeing the glory of God. What comes next? It, we come to that place, as did Mary, where we are willing and even eager to sacrificially give to the Lord. You know, we come to that place where we hold nothing back from Jesus. You understand what I mean by that? We come to that place where we say, Lord, if this is what you want, that, is, that I will do because you are of greatest value to me, because I recognize who you are, and I want to live my life for you. We come to that place because we recognize that there is nothing in our life that is more valuable than him. You know, unlike Judas, we don't see value in other things. We don't prioritize ourselves. We don't live our life seeking our own benefit anymore. No. All we have is just this desire to use the means that God has given to us to worship the Lord. A question for you, as I often ask, the question is this. This is the most valuable thing that you have to give. That's what Mary does. There's no question here. What is that precious treasure that you possess that you might use to worship God? What is that, that precious treasure that you have that you might sacrificially give to Jesus? Now, I'm asking that because that is so clearly part of this text. It's so clearly part of the teaching of this text. It's at the heart of this teaching. Let me put it another way. <laughs> Have you ever done anything absolutely outlandish for Jesus as an act of worship that others might observe and as a result call you a fool? That's what this text is about, my friends. 
It's us coming to that place in our hearts of worshiping Jesus and giving to Jesus dramatically. So much so that other people who lack faith just don't understand. Well, let me ask you this question for impact sake. Have you ever thought about, have you ever actually given an entire year's salary to Jesus? I hope that frames the question for you. That's exactly what Mary does. That's, that's probably the most direct and literal translation of this, or application of this text. Has it ever even crossed your mind? Would you do it? People would call you a fool if you did, but Jesus wouldn't if you do it for the right heart. How about this? We talk about giving 10% of our income to God. People would hear that maybe you're considering that and say, don't do it. That's foolishness. That's throwing money away. You'd be a fool to do that. They wouldn't understand. My friends, that's only 10%, not 100%, such as Mary gave. I want to tell you, if you were to do that, Jesus wouldn't consider you a fool. He would see your act as a worshipful act of love. Well, what about this idea? I've heard people who are going into pastoral ministry or into missionary work, and I've heard these comments about them, things like they're throwing their life away or what a waste of a life. Have you heard that kind of comment? It's basically somebody saying they're acting like fools. But I want to tell you, Jesus wouldn't think that of you if you were to give yourself in that way to his service. He'd understand it as worship. How about this one? Listen, I, I mention this at times, and I don't know whether people actually grapple with what I say in this or take it seriously or let the meaning of this sink deep into their hearts, but I'm going to say it again. We can give our time to Christ. See, time is a precious commodity because it's so limited. We only have so much of it, and we seem to have so much to do. But we can give our time to Jesus to serve him, to build his kingdom, to follow after him, to nurture a relationship with him. Or we can use it for ourselves and for our own benefit. You see, give it to Christ as, a, as an act of worship and he will honor you. And he will appreciate it. And he will affirm what you have done because he understands what you are doing as a recognition of his worth in your life because of what you have come to see of him. Do you know, in the end of the day, the most valuable thing we can give to Jesus, and I bet you a lot of you are ahead of me in this one, the most valuable thing we can give to Jesus is our lives. You know, Jesus says that's what he calls from us. If we are to follow him, we're to pick up our cross and follow him, even to the point of death, he was saying in that moment. Jesus wasn't interested in sort of this casual Christianity where you kind of believe, but you live for yourself. That's Judas. What Jesus wants is us to give our lives fully and completely to him, to hold nothing back, to consider nothing in our lives, not our possessions, not our time, not our energies, not even our very lives is as valuable as him. And he calls us to sacrifice ourselves, living sacrifices, Paul writes, as an act of worship before God. And while other people might consider that to be an act of a fool, I want to tell you, my friends, Jesus wouldn't call you a fool. He would understand what you do as an act of worship. He would understand what's in your heart. He would understand if you came to him and say, Jesus, I give you myself fully and completely. I give you my whole being. And I will follow you from this day forward. No matter what it is you call me to do, I will do it. Well, no matter what it is you call me to step away from, I will step away. I am fully and completely given over to you because you are worthy of my life. And in this act of, of, of great sacrifice before you, I recognize your value, and I worship you. And I want to tell you, my friends, from that point we go forward to live our lives as, 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 as an act of worship in everything we do, 
taking everything that God has entrusted to us and using it for his glory, not our own, not our own self-benefit, not so that we can have more of what the world offers. We don't care about those things anymore. Mary just didn't care about the value of this perfume. All she cared about was honoring Christ. And I ask you today, is that how you live your life? Sacrificed to Jesus. Living for him. Recognizing his worth and value in life as being superior to anything else, even more than our lives themselves. Not looking for the benefit that we can achieve, but looking to honor Jesus. Can I ask you in all honesty, have you come to that place of faith? Have you fully and completely committed your life to Christ as an act of worship before God? You know what I really like about this text? One of the things that I would just, I think it's, it's kind of cool and it's really important that in this anointing of the, in the anointing of the feet of Jesus with his incredibly expensive sacrificial giving, it's what Mary wanted to do. It was in her heart. <laughs> she longed, having seen the glory of God in Christ, she longed to worship him. She longed for him to be honored. She longed for him to understand what he meant to her. In the end of the day, it really is a very simple question. Will we sacrifice our lives out of love for Jesus? I want to tell you this. This is what Christ desires. This is what Christ affirms when it happens. This is what Jesus calls us to. And he praises. You know, some might call it foolishness. But I want to tell you, Jesus never will. I want to ask you, I was going to say this week, but I don't know that we want to wait that long, but will you do something outlandish for God? Will you do something that, that, that flows from your heart of gratitude, knowing who Jesus is, knowing what he has done for you in life, knowing what he has done for you in the cross? Will you do something shocking for him as an act of sacrificial giving and worship? Here's what I want to say to you as I wind, wind down this morning. The worst thing that can happen after I finish speaking this morning and we experience communion together and we conclude, the worst thing that can happen is that you do nothing. This text is a call to active worship. This text is God's word to us and it's a call to, to, to sacrificing that which is of great value to us in order to worship Jesus, in order to communicate our hearts to him, in order to let him know that he is of greatest value to us, not anything else, not even ourselves. So I say to you, how will you honor Jesus? How will you worship him? How will you show him what he means to you. Let's pray. Lord, we gaze on this text and we think about it and we understand what Mary did and we are left shocked and in awe. But Lord, what an incredible thing happened in those moments when Mary communicated her heart to Christ by this incredible self-giving, sacrificial act. Lord, we thank you for her even now, thousands of years later. We thank you for what she did. We thank you, Lord, for how she blessed you. And our Lord, our prayer is that you will show us how we might sacrifice for you. We might give up what is precious to us in order to communicate to you what you mean to us. 
Lord Jesus, we pray that you'll take us to that place. We don't want to do this out of a simple legalistic uh, act, which we might engage just because we've been told to, Lord. We want to do it because we've seen your glory. And we have been so deeply moved because we have had our eyes opened to see who you are, to recognize what you have done, that, Lord, we just want to worship you. So, Lord, I pray for these people listening today. I pray that you will work by your spirit. I pray that you would reveal to them your glory. And I pray it again this week that they might come to that place where they're eager and willing, desirous, to worship you in this way. Lord God, do your work in us. We need you to work so that we might see, so that we might worship as Mary worshiped. Lord, we come to communion now. We come to take the bread representing your body, the cup representing your shed blood. And we just begin by saying, thank you, Lord Jesus. Oh, what a God you are. What a thing you have done in obedience to your Father to fulfill the will of your Father, to act out of love for us that we might have a means of salvation, a means of escape, a means of having our sin forgiven so that we might become the children of God. Lord Jesus, we praise you for what you have done and we worship you. And even now, Lord, we submit ourselves to you. We, we give you our lives that we might honor you, that we might love you, that we might worship you. Lord God, we pray that you would forgive us for our sin. We can't come to this time without a time of confession. And we pray, our Lord, uh, for forgiveness now. For we have failed you. We have done what is wrong. Action, thought, words, sins of commission, sins of omission. God, we just, we're not able to live up to the standard of, of perfection. And, and we recognize that in grace, you have dealt with that. But Lord, we want to honor you. And we pray that when we have failed you, that you will forgive us. That you will cleanse us from all unrighteousness by the blood of Christ. Having asked our God, we receive that forgiveness. We believe it. And now we proceed, Lord, to communion with you. This we ask in Christ's name. Amen. My friends, we do come to this holy moment. For those of us who follow Jesus, we act in obedience to his words. He said to do this. Whenever you take this bread and drink this cup, do it in remembrance of me. He wants us to remember what he has done for us. Because in these moments, our eyes can be opened to see his glory. So often in the scripture, especially in John, his crucifixion is described as his glorification. My friends, he died for you. And he died for me that we might be his, that we might belong to the Father, that we might be forgiven and become children of God and know eternal life from this point forward and forever. And today we come in obedience to Jesus' instruction to take the bread and the cup and to be fed spiritually. Yes, we eat and drink, but we are nurtured by the Spirit of God, by the Spirit of Christ who is with us to bestow grace upon us. That we might know who we are, that we might know his love for us, that we might dr be drawn into this deep fellowship with God, communion with him. So my friends, to that end, I ask you to, to take the bread that's before you. And to remember that in the night that Jesus was betrayed, he took bread and he broke it and said, this is my body broken for you. Do this in remembrance of me.
scripture says then that in the same manner Jesus took the cup and said, this cup is the new covenant in my blood, which is shed for the forgiveness of sin. Drink all of it. Lord Jesus, in this moment, we worship you, for you are worthy of our worship. In this moment, Lord Jesus, we recognize both who you are and what you have done for us, and we worship you. We humble ourselves before you. We give to you. We give ourselves to you, Lord Jesus. And you are worthy of this gift. We recognize, Lord, in this place of, of humility, in this place of worship, in this place of our giving to you because of what you've given in, to us and done for us. But Lord, you are an amazing Savior, an amazing Lord. So, Lord, receive our worship today. It comes from a heart of gratitude. It comes from Hearts filled with love comes from hearts, Lord, which want you to know how much you mean to us. Lord Jesus, we worship you today, for you are worthy. You are worthy. Bless us as we go from this place. Guide us, protect us, comfort us, strengthen us. Lead us into life, Lord Jesus. But enable us at all times to be people who remember your value and sacrifice all for you. So we pray in your name. Amen. Now, may the grace, mercy, and peace of God, Father, Son, and Holy Spirit, be with each of you today and forevermore. Amen. I saw Satan fall like lightning. I saw darkness run for color. But the miracle that I just can't get over, my name is registered in heaven I believe in signs and wonders I have resurrection power But the miracle that I just can't get over My name is registered in heaven My praise belongs to you forever This is my testimony from there to life, His grace rewrote my story. I'll testify by Jesus Christ the righteous. I'm justified. This is my testimony. This is my testimony. Come together, sons and daughters. Fall with blood and wash in water Sing the praises of the Spirit, Son and Father Oh God, we'll finish what He started Our God, we'll finish what He started Oh, this is my testimony From death to life Cause grace rewrote my story I'll testify By Jesus Christ the righteous I'm justified This is my testimony This is my testimony If I'm not dead, you're not done 
Greater things still to come. Oh, I believe I'm not dead, you're not done. Greater things still to come. Oh, I believe I'm not dead, you're not done. Greater things still to come. Oh, I believe I'm not dead, you're not done. Greater things still to come. Oh, I believe this is my testimony from death to life. This grace rewrote my story. I'll testify by Jesus Christ the righteous. I'm justified. This is my testimony. Oh, I'm alive. This is my testimony from death to life. Cause grace rewrote my story. I'll testify. Oh, Jesus Christ the righteous. I'm justified. This is my testimony. This is my testimony. Oh, this is my testimony. Never have I ever, ever found a love 